and i feel proud to introduce the speaker of the day dr george d dangas he is a professor of cardiology and vascular surgery from icon school of medicine mount sinai um exhaustive profile and i feel proud to introduce the uh, speaker of the day dr george d dangas he is a professor of cardiology and and vascular surgery from icon school of medicine mount sinai new york uh, his publications are exhaustive more than 500 publications some other thing which is very familiar to us like uh, horizon ami galileo or twilight trials what was interesting is sir is an adept interventionalist and excellent cardiologist in the form not only on the intervention not only coronary but also periphery not only just coronary or periphery but also his structural intervention from tabor to mitacle more than 500 publications excellent teacher we see do see nowadays interventional cardiologists try to keep themselves away from clinical cardiology and medicine but we do see a great interest and wonderful support to the to the five overall sir is a trustee of sky all of us know sky and distinguished teacher award in 19 2017 by american college of cardiology i can keep on talk about him but that will become a separate talk but it's my pleasure and i feel proud and i would like to welcome my co-chair today dr sambasivam my great friend for more than three decades leading interventional cardiologist great teacher from coimbatore will be chairing with me dr samba can you start the proceeding by talking few words so that dr dangas can take over the proceeding talk over to you hello hello can you hear hello Audible. Hello. I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murli, Dr. Bhupati. It's a pleasure to be a, a moderator of this wonderful session from a, a, a great stalwart who was George Dangos, uh, who has got a, a great. Uh, A basic uh, continued interest in clinical cardiology uh, him being a great interventional and structural interventionalist so uh, the wonderful topic that we have got today the anti thrombotics which play a very important role in day to day practice of a clinical and interventional cardiologist what is the what has been the past what is the current situation and we got a huge things to uh, our uh, you know uh, benefit in the future so to tell you all about the story of this anti thrombotic journey we have Professor Dangas, over to you, sir. Thank you very much for your kind introductions, and I'm uh, very happy to be able to participate in uh, uh, in in your in your ground round uh, um, uh, program um, uh, this uh, evening. in india and very happy uh, to uh, have trained one of your colleagues here uh, in new york and and also very happy to see that there is a wide participation from india as uh, members and fellows of the society of cardiac angiography and interventions as well as as uh, 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 members of the uh, acc and other organizations that we all participate and communicate uh, the uh, uh subject today is a, a very very interesting one and also a very large one the endothrombotics in acute coronary syndromes the past the present and the future and clearly uh the target of the clot is associated with everything we do in cardiology and is outlined by the fact that the clotting cascade and the platelets are really interacting in a tremendously important way inside the coronary arteries of the heart thereby affecting everything else they also interact in any other artery but i don't want to broaden the scope of my talk to also include the uh, other arterial beds and even the venous system but let's focus on what is very very important for cardiology inside the coronaries where the four clot is formed First of all the clot is a mass that mass is mainly platelets and the platelets are here uh, 
primarily not to normal endothelium, to diseased or disrupted endothelium. All right, so we're to have platelet adhesion and then platelet activation, and then boom, the platelet aggregate is formed. Now, that's what we used to call white clot or just to clarify what's happening. Uh, if geographically, the 3D mass of the clot is mainly platelets. Now on top of the platelet membrane, the coagulation cascade is also triggered and evolves in an unfavorable way. The main pathway is a tissue factor because tissue is any disrupted artery immediately includes a tissue factor that is a shortcut towards local thrombin generation and thrombin activity. And then this feeds into further platelet activation and further platelet aggregation. So have all these positive feedbacks. Why is that? Because this mechanism is not exactly made to clot off our arteries. It is made to clot off our skin when we are cut and we bleed. And obviously the body mechanisms, any human, any, any, any human being mechanisms wants to make sure that the, 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 there's no bleeding out. So it's tremendously important for the body to achieve hemostasis, which is a positive thing because people are bleeding. Unfortunately, it is also associated with endovascular thrombosis, which is a bad thing. And that's why we have a many, many options to block either by anticoagulant drugs you see on top, or even more so by the antiplatelet drugs that may block either the platelet activation, the adhesion, the aggregation also. And perhaps we, because there's so many redundant mechanisms, we really need to use many of those drugs in combination. That may create obviously some problems, including how effective we are, how do we combine what, and are we causing any side effects, primarily bleeding? Let's go, first of all, in acute coronary syndrome, the patient is in the hospital or coming into the hospital. So let's just focus a little bit uh, on what do we use uh, parenteral, either IV or subcutaneous. The orals we leave for a little later. Patients in the hospital primarily will treat them with something IV, unfractionated heparin, you can see that in the beginning, which is a practical medication. We're gonna talk about some of the, uh, some of its aspects later on. It requires antithrombin-3, may activate platelets, and requires an intravenous infusion and adjustment according to APTT. The last one caused a lot of uh, uh, confusion sometimes and a lot of effort, and therefore the low molecular weight heparins uh, are, are devised, uh, such as an oxaparin, adult tempering can be any of them. And ultimately the smallest possible uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin is uh, the one that is a pentasaccharide, the fondoparinox uh, essentially. But now is indirect inhibitor of the 10A. And further down the line, we can have direct thrombin inhibitors such as a hirudin, which is naturally occurring. We don't use that anymore because it has a longer half-life and very difficult to, uh, uh, to reverse, impossible to reverse. And the bavalirudin that at the very least, although it, it, can, it cannot be reversed, it has a short half-life. And also does not activate platelets because inhibits heparin directly. Let's see, why don't we talk about heparin? Uh, it's a very old, oldest drug. Unless we deeply understand it, we cannot really go any forward. So it requires antithrombin-3. There's a lot of variation in dosage. And uh, essentially, this is because this drug is not a single drug. It's a mix of very variable length molecular chains. Each one of them has a differential effect. The, even the mix of the chains vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. And um, clearly this is why the complex kinetics need to a nonlinear response and we have to adjust it by measuring the APTT every six hours. Also, it's, the, in a, in a, it's unable to bind the clot bind thrombin and is associated with a heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Uh, the low molecular heparin was essentially addressed the last two aspects we said. It decreases the incidence of HIT, 
However, let's not confuse that. It's not a treatment for HIT in any way, all right? And if HIT is established, we need to use a direct thrombin inhibitor, such as by bavalirudin or argatroban, for example, if there is th thrombosis. However, low molecular heparins, because they don't have such big variability, they have a little bit of a uniform from antithrombotic effect or a more uniform antithrombotic effect, it can be uh, addressed by weight-based dosage and allows treatment uh, without adjustment. And at the same time, the subcutaneous dosage once a day or twice a day may allow outpatient treatment, something that was very difficult with a heparin. And for example, there was a specific earlier trial, the ESSENCE trial, and um, uh, team, team 11B, I, I think, together, uh, they utilized a, an, an oxaparin in the hospital and then continuing for a week outside the hospital. It was the era at the time that we didn't have too many potent anti oral antiplatelet agents, for example. And that actually fared very well, the ability to uh, pro prolong a little bit the anticoagulation if the after patient is... Uh, is, uh, is discharged. That's a unique pathway. We no longer use it. However, you can highlight that how handy this new, at that time, advent of a subcutaneous once a day regimen might have um, uh, helped us out at the time. The problem uh, of the subcutaneous and the dosage, uh, however, was still a, a little bit of a problem when a patient goes for PCI and we really needed to have a very high level of anticoagulation during the procedure. So there was a little of a confusion of how do we uh, transition from an, a subcutaneous dosage of the enoxaparin up in the general medical wards or in, in the emergency room. And how, if the patient comes to cath lab, do we need to give more? How much do we give? Do we give more sub -Q? Do we give IV? Do we give bolus? Um, is it possible? What's the dosage? And indeed, this transitioning uh, in a couple of trials, including the ones I show here, was associated with more bleeding. In general, this was not bad, the comparison, but it was really bad with the patients who went in cath lab because this transitioning wasn't figured out well at all. And, and the patients were essentially somehow overdosed either by the extra enoxaparin or by doctors feeling unsure of the dosage and administering unfractionated heparin in the cath lab, five to 10,000 units, in addition to the enoxaparin sub-Q the patient might have, um, might have uh, received earlier that morning. Um, so this practical, as you can see, um, a problem uh, haunted uh, the application of this medication that until that point seemed pretty good, particularly as it enabled us to, go, to treat the patient for a few days after hospitalization. Anyhow, uh, going further, an advent uh, that occurred, an advent that occurred was the, uh, uh, was the uh, 2B3A inhibitors um, and, the, uh, and the fact that for a, all of a sudden, we were able to attack the platelets with something more than aspirin. That was, a, imagine, at the time we only had aspirin. Um, and 2B3 inhibitors were thought to have um, a direct role in inhibiting the so-called final common pathway, which was very attractive at the time. Like the platelets aggravate, active, uh, adhere, activate, and then they have to aggregate. If we go and block the aggregation, that's a final common pathway before uh, all, the, all the red clot comes around and organized, maybe we can do a great job. And in a series of trials, a bolus plus 12 hour infusion of abcixibab was tested very successfully in the EPIC, in ACS and angioplasty uh, alone, no stent, in the epilogue in more elective patients, again with angioplasty, and finally in epistent with non-urgent angioplasty and stent. And clearly one can see that it did decrease a lot the incidence of death or MI uh, 
or a death MI or TVR, at the same time, you can see on the right side extremely clearly that whatever job was to be done was just done within a day. Uh, you can see the curves separate immediately and stay up the same way all the way to 30 days. So um, unfortunately, this very easy to understand message wasn't, didn't quite translate to a clinical practice of bolus only and no study actually, um, no significantly large study has um, investigated bolus only in ACS and PCI with a stent. Uh, had this been done, perhaps this would have continued to be an extremely successful um, uh, therapy, uh, but it was ultimately haunted by the fact that the 12 hour infusion caused a lot of bleeding complications. And remember at the time we were using tremendously uh, high um, uh, rates of femoral access that maximize bleeding complications. So I think we, we, we covered the variety of 2B3 Hebrews that came afterwards. And uh, then something that started occurring as well and is actually approved for wider use in Canada is Fondaparinox, which is called a 10A inhibitor, but in all for all practical purposes is the lowest possible chain, um, low molecular, the lowest possible molecular weight heparin is the pentasaccharide only with only with five sugar bases and inhibits the uh, factor 10A. Uh, is once a day strictly. It is great for outpatient utilization, particularly in venous thromboembolism and PE. Uh, it has been used in ACS and in Canada, they use it all the time, quite frankly, but again, has a problem of what to do uh, with the PCI. And the investigators of large trials went ahead and showed that the bleeding is cut a lot if you use from the Paranox. Nonetheless, whoever got in the cath lab, they advised no additional dose and there were a lot of uh, uh, catheter related thrown by that have essentially scared away interventional cardiologists from, uh, from desiring this medication. And uh, unless additional bavalirudin or additional infraction of heparin is given at the cath lab, it's not safe. But at the same time, if you give additional thrombotics IV, you can see that all this, uh, you can reasonably expect that the advantage in saving bleeding complications is actually going to fade away a little bit. Uh, nonetheless, in a, in a very organized fashion, in a very clinically protocol driven and a lot of discipline among the various sites, the Canadians seem to be very, very pleased by use of this medication widely in, in ACS as well as in PE and uh, other DVT and other thromboembolism situations. And these are the trials again for the Fondaparnox, very uh, favorable regarding the bleeding. So if someone really wants to uh, treat conservatively an ACS patient, one can say that this agent could be extremely favorable with a dedicated once a day subcutaneous dosage. Then we come to another frontier. The other frontier is direct thrombin inhibitors. Forget about the antithrombins, forget about the different chains and the mixes of drugs. We want to know exactly what the drug we're doing and exactly what we're giving and exactly what the drug is doing. And this focus, this opened up the era of hold on, let's stop making patients bleed. I think that was the main message and the first realization we had that bleeding really matters. But of course we know that, but how do you practically realize it if you don't have a drug that can do a job you need it to do, and the 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 uh, uh, turnoff time is going to be very fast. So within a couple of hours, usually uh, average of two hours, bavalirudin is gone. It is uh, metabolized by the plasma esterases, and these frag the fragments are then excreted by the kidney, and they don't exert themselves much antithrombotic antithrombin effect. 
So it was, it was uh, unfortunately, the study in the ACS, the acuity trial, was somewhat misleading because it was designed by the time, and I was happy to be part of it, but it was designed at the time of uh, 2B3A inhibition. And um, there were three arms, the babalirudin in, and then now we're talking about ACS patients coming from ER, all cameras. Some of them went for PCI, about 60%, about 10, 15% went for bypass, and about 20% or so had to just medical therapy, pretty, pretty classic, all encompassing. In, in these patients, the, 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 the investigators, we experimented with uh, uh, babalirudin plus 2B3A inhibitor. Uh, heparin plus 2B3 inhibitor. Uh, and uh, we did not unfortunately include a, and the control arm was uh, uh, was heparin, but the, uh, but the, uh, uh, was heparin plus 2B3 inhibitor, but uh, we did not really uh, experiment with babalirudin alone. So uh, we hadn't at that point, you see, realized how important it will be later to, um, uh, to see what's going on with a bleeding reduction strategy on its own. So uh, everything was a wash. Uh, so bowel could be used uh, as well as heparin. Nonetheless, with the presence of two B3 inhibitors in both arms, sort of equalize the bleeding. And this, this uh, type of approach never took traction. And bowel has been a drug that primarily located in the cath lab for use in the PCI, uh, but uh, not so much, uh, not at all really in the ER. Um, um, and uh, uh, the other aspect that we saw is that further analysis, including a very complex meta-analysis that Dr. Biddle and I did, indicated that bevalirudin may have a little bit of a problem if uh, radial is to be used a lot why? Because the radial is, um, I may mean, take away the bleeding risks on its own. And the, uh, also, if the uh, 2B3 inhibitors are not used. Uh, finally, uh, studies primarily from England indicated that in acute myocardial infarction, uh, you may need a little bit more Beverly Rooting infusion and not more, not really an immediate abrupt interruption after the PCI is finished. And at this point, we do employ two to four hours of bavalirudin infusion in such cases. However, in a, a, I would say, been burned from the bleeding complications of the long 2B3 inhibitor infusions, the original studies of bavalirudin had omitted uh, pretty much uh, the uh, post-procedure uh, uh, infusions, and we ended up paying a price for it in the um, uh, STEMI type ACS patients, particularly because several of them were also treated with clopidogrel. And as you know, the clopidogrel uh, uh, includes a lot of patients with some resistance. So if you're unlucky, and you have a thrombotic STEMI, you're not responding very well to clopidogrel, and we shut down your bavalirudin, um, or also maybe because of the MI situation, you're not absorbing well, your, or metabolizing well your clopidogrel, then your bavalirudin uh, interruption may have a situation that, uh, that uh, uh, gives you essentially unprotected for a couple of hours just after PCI, and that's when acute center thrombosis may occur. And you can see in the very nice graphs that Dr. Biddle and his statistical team created, you can see that how the risks are really different in populations who are STEMI versus non-STEMI and in populations who are treated with 2B3A versus non-2B3A and how the bleeding risk is really uh, very, very valuable in femoral, but not so valuable in radial and that the bleeding risks are uh, uh, the bleeding risk reduction bavalirudin really plays a role if you want to use a 2B3 inhibitor. However, it also hurts you if you want to use, a, a, if you want to not use an infusion of bavalirudin and the patient has a STEMI and gets us to thrombosis. Um, let's go a little bit further into the guidelines that ultimately you can see what is the summation of uh, 
of uh, clearly a fraction that heparin is recommended. Uh, enoxaparin is high up as well. And bavarudin has been downgraded to 2B, particularly because of the situation that I just explained to you regarding the shortfalls or the shortcoming uh, around the uh, around the risks in STEMI and also around the not such great efficacy addition in radial, just because radial doesn't have that much bleeding. So let's go off to antiplatelets. Again, in the beginning, I told you that most of the clot is really platelet and platelet is really the beginning of the clot. If you block the platelet, the platelet is gonna, the, the clot is gonna go away. Let's think about now, how do we block something? And let's think about uh, something outside cardiology so you can understand why, for example, the clopidogrel may be a more powerful and important aspect than a 2B3 inhibitor. Uh, you have a long, a long river uh, and you have some dams around the river. Okay, let's take, for example, a big river that is uh, near to my home country, Greece, just across the Mediterranean is the Nile River. And you can see that the Nile River has several dams, but if you look the location of the dams, they're all upstream. Why is that? Because if you try to block a river all the way downstream where it enters the sea, there is just so much water and so, so much power that you're just not gonna do such a good job. However, if you block the fossa all the way up top near the mountains, you may have a higher chance to do so. And you can see in every river that has dams all over the world, they block them up in the mountains of shortly there. They never block them in the valley. That's why if you block the platelets for being activated, you may not need that much effort. But if you try to block them when they're aggregating already, the, 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 a lot of water comes against you, you're not gonna have a flood of platelets coming at that point is not going to be as successful or as easy a job. And again, wrist stenosis and thrombosis have been a, a matter of ACS and PCI because many patients, about as I said, 60 or 70 percent of ACS patients will end up having a PCI. And in order to implant a metallic foreign body, you better have figured out your clot busting scenarios and how is that gonna work? So you don't want an, a thrombosis to occur inside our stents. That's very clear. So the advent of stents against thrombosis and ov obviously that enabled their use in PCI came after the realization that a dual oral antiplatelet therapy was much more important. Remember the story I told you about the dams and the river, a very important in disallowing the stent thrombosis. Ticlopidin had unfortunately some hematological side effects and clopidogrel came by, by, although one may say that maybe slightly not as potent, slightly less potent than ticlopidin, nonetheless was not toxic. I remember ticlopidin, we needed to do CBCs at one week and one month afterwards in all patients and we had maybe 5% or even 10% of some uh, low counts, particularly very bad if you had pancytopenia or TTP or uh, neutropenia, very bad. Clopidogrel, you just don't have to worry about it. And there was a little bit of a trade-off, sure. And we, we tried to manage by giving additional doses, higher doses, 300, 600 loadings, those came about later on. Initially, we started with regular doses and not really a lot of loading. Those we added on later when we realized the potency just wasn't there in the, for the first days. And in ACS, we had a massive trial, the PCI cure and the cure, um, the two trials, uh, actually one trial with a big subset, the PCI, in, in primarily from Canada, and, uh, and, and, and only a fraction of patients had PCI, uh, but everyone in this trial was uh, uh, was treated with uh, clopidogrel versus placebo, which was essentially just aspirin, and everybody got heparin or whatever other treatments they had. So both in PC in cure 
the general population and the PCI cure, the results were just about as you can see there, that clopidogrel beat placebo and became a very, very important drug, oral drug in ACS. And say, hold on, could it be such a big difference if we add an oral drug on top of a massive IV heparin? Remember again, the story with building a small dam all the way up in the mountain versus trying to figure out what's going on when all the water from the river comes against you near the end in the valley. Then we had obvious problems with, with the clopidogrel and its resistance to some patients. Why is that? First of all, it has to be absorbed. That would be number one problem, particularly if we give Hello? a lot of water or give a lot of, uh, or we give a lot of, uh, um, or give a lot of uh, sedation. And uh, second, it has to have a two-step uh, uh, metabolism in the liver to an active metabolite. Um, Tacagrelor just has to be absorbed. It's not metabolized. It works differently. It's not irreversibly bound on the platelets. Uh, it's used again uh, with uh, twice a day, unfortunately, not once a day, but uh, it produces a higher level and more predictable uh, 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 concentration derived um, 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 uh, platelet inhibition, again in the same receptor, the P2Y12. And the prasugrel is essentially a more closer to be an analog of clopidogrel. It only includes a one-step metabolism. It is again a, um, a, a direct irreversible inhibitor of the P2Y12 receptor. This means that if you want to inhibit it, you have to transfuse new platelets to dilute the drug over many platelets. Uh, unlike Tacagrelor, Tacagrelor, there's so much concentration of, of, of drug in the plasma that just uh, uh, transfusion is not going to do anything. And again, Prasugrel decreases the stent thrombosis and decreases cardiovascular MI or stroke compared to clopidogrel in the very important trial, the Triton. That was, by the way, was mostly in ACS PCI. And Takagro was also in the uh, included in the PLATO trial, included all cameras of ACS, not necessarily the PCI part. And then we also have a Cangrelor. What is Cangrelor? Cangrelor is essentially an IV form, very, very similar to Takagrelor. The feature of IV Cangrelor is that it, uh, it has capacity within a, few, within a minute or two. And if you shut it off, it goes away within 30 minutes. So that gives a tremendous capacity right away and also has a great hemostasis after you shut it down. So particularly, it has enabled me to do PCI in patients who have ACS postoperatively, let's say post cabbage with chest tubes in place or uh, I don't know, post some kind of non-cardiac surgery and still a lot of sensitivity about whether it would be a massive bleed if we give the oral uh, P2Y12 inhibitors, uh, and uh, you know, Cangrelor can be pretty handy in some of these situations. Of course, this was not exactly the way it was used in this trial. This is the practical way we use it in day to day, in the uh, in the large trial, Champion Phoenix, in, in the essentially decrease interprocedure events, as you can see again by the curves. Remind me very well by the oral uh, the IV to be three inhibitor effect in the Epistent trial I showed you earlier. All the effect is right, right then and there, nowhere else. Unlike 2B3 inhibitors, we do not require a, a long infusion. And unlike 2B3 inhibitors, the reversibility is much faster. So the safety feature is enhanced with this medication. What was happening at the same time, of course, is that uh, while we're working on the drugs, also the stents became better. We were fighting restenosis in all of the 1990s. And in early 2000s, we started up with a drug looting stance that nearly eliminated restenosis to a single digit percentages from like 20 or 30 percent that was before. Uh, originally, due to the polymers issues and due to maybe the drug toxicity issues and the dose or delivery of the drug elution into the uh, blood vessel, uh, there was some thrombosis. Uh, 
And particularly this might have been accentuated in ACS and STEMI and shock and all these acute cases. And therefore prolonged durations of these dual antiplatelet therapies was then very practically employed in order to avert some of these risks. But stents became better. And as stents became better, uh, we started thinking very simply and very practically, do we really need to expose patients uh, for a long time into the dual antiplatelet therapy, or maybe we can uh, uh, judiciously utilize that. And that became also a very important new concept. Again, this is some background regarding the DS, and you can see they eliminate the instant restenosis, the intimal hyperplasia. However, if they're not covered well, then uh, the struts may have a lot of thrombosis. And clearly in a very large meta-analysis, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the various uh, drug looting stents were much better in the second generation than the first generation regarding the thrombosis as well, indicating that the technology of thinner strut stents and improved polymers and, uh, and drug pathology at the vessel wall uh, made these stents very much more um, uh, safe, even in ACS, STEMI, etc. Um, at the same time, we started being with all these patients, ACS and others been treated for such a long time with dual antiplatelet therapy, we started investigating and practically seeing what's going on. There's a lot of bleeding going left and right. What is happening here and what can we, how can we first of all understand bleeding? What does bleeding mean? And it meant that there's also a gradation. We all fear like threatening bleeding, major bleeding, and minor bleeding is a nuisance, but still bothers people and may end up in discontinuing important medications. And we had a very interesting paper indicating that uh, bleeding and MI may be competing risks, but as you go, but the bleeding affects more the mortality later on than the MI, whatever affects is if you have a massive MI right away after your angioplasty, then that's a problem. But if you have minor MIs here and there, they may not be as important. Whereas if you get a major bleed, you better be careful no matter what it is. I think that was an important new um, idea and it came about the acuity trial database in ACS patients with or without PCR. So it all became all of a sudden, uh, as the second generation DS became better than, than, uh, than uh, in, in thrombosis, we started figuring out, can we go back from a year of DAP to short to a few months of DAP, or even to a few weeks of DAP, and see where we were with that. And obviously, you can see how we went. We started with four weeks, PCI, the cure invest expanded to a year, then we go back to six months, then go to 12 months or even two years during the, uh, during the, uh, during the scare of the first generation DS thrombosis, then we went back to three months to six months, and now we're investigating of how we can stratify patients in high bleeding risk, low bleeding risk, and super high bleeding risk, and accordingly employ one, 12 months, three to six months, or one month of dual antiplatelet therapy. And one of the issues essentially also we understand that if you keep adding drugs, we have heparin, you add aspirin, you add a clopidogrel, you add I don't know what else, you keep adding on top of each other, obviously, you know, we're gonna reach a point that how much can you add without causing bleeding, particularly with long-term therapies. So uh, trying to figure out, do still a good job, but with less bleeding by withdrawing some of the strategies might be a key to further improve the uh, patient outcomes. Uh, and that's what we're experimenting with the two P P2 Y12 inhibitors that are very, very interesting. And in the twilight, uh, we decided to take an approach of not just uh, until that time when we investigating DAP to stop in DAP, everybody was saying, okay, are we continue clopidogrel or are we essentially stopping clopidogrel and continue with aspirin? Over here, we said, you know what? When we do that, we seem to have a problem with aspirin alone and ischemia. And if we continue clopidogrel forever, that could be a problem in the, in the bleeding. In twilight, why don't we do an innovative thing and say, you know what, we stop the aspirin. 
So this way we maintain a greater ischemia protection by the potent PDY12 inhibitor of the tagaglor. And at the same time, maybe we have some bleeding savings by stopping the aspirin. And let's see how that fared. And first of all, let's understand where we use high risk patients in the studies, not everyone with ACS. You got to have a higher uh, clinical criteria and one higher and geographic criteria, and then you decide what's going on. Okay, and you can see the clinical criteria in the left side, you want to be older, a female or a troponin positive ACS or established disease, uh, multivessel, multival, mul multivascular disease, diabetes or renal failure, or if you have on the other side, multivessel disease, thrombotic lesions, bifurcation lesions, etc. Uh, the protocol called for the 90 days to stop the aspirin and replace it with placebo. Everybody otherwise got Tacagro. The results were incredible. By stopping the aspirin, you cut by half the long-term major bleeding, although everyone does continue the Tacagro for a year. And the ischemia was identical. That was also tremendous. This means that we did we only gained, we didn't give up anything. And if you go and ask the question, okay, well, that was a practical question. Uh, say, you know what, maybe your study was like, okay, whatever, I have a, had a simple lesion, had one lesion and you know, what's going on if I have a lot of complex disease, that's not gonna really work. That's why I, 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 I led the uh, twilight complex secondary analysis and, uh, and that included uh, 2,300 complex patients and there were 65% did not meet the multiple criteria of complex PCI. And you can see that the benefit of the, of the, of the strategy I showed you before, the bleeding savings without any trade-off in ischemia, you can see that it was evident no matter what kind of complex lesion we targeted. Three vessel, more than three lesions, stents over 60 millimeter, bifurcations, complex total occlusions, left main, etc. And particularly if you had one a single criteria or multiple criteria, also it didn't matter. So the, the, the saving, the, 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 the bleeding saving strategy can be also achieved very easily by stopping the aspirin. And by the way, is this only one trial? It was just a fluke? No, it wasn't. We have a simultaneously publishing this year, just a few months after Twilight, the Koreans also published a TICO trial, also in ACS patients. And they also um, gave three, month of, uh, uh, three months and then stopped the aspirin and everybody else continued on Dicagrelor and they found pretty much the same thing. You can see that after until two, three months, uh, everything is the same and after three months, bleeding becomes um, uh, much, uh, much uh, better uh, with the, uh, with, uh, without the aspirin. And uh, regarding the, um, uh, the different uh, ev other events, again, there is, no, there is no difference. If anything, the monotherapy did better uh, regarding um, MACE uh, events as well. So again, we have uh, now two studies, the Twilight as well as the Korean study in ACS patients, particularly the TICO was only ACS. Uh, that validating the fact that uh, getting rid of the aspirin might actually be a very good uh, alternative to uh, uh, decrease bleeding a lot while maintain uh, the, uh, uh, the efficacy. Um, the guidelines have been a little complex. The type of drug that you see up top, initially in the ER, bleeding risks, um, uh, and then you have to stratify the patient to low, high, or very high, and you can see how it goes uh, in the various options, uh, low bleeding risk, many options, high bleeding risk, uh, short duration of therapies and fewer options. I don't wanna go through the slide, it's complex, but clearly you can see the way to do it is you really need to understand the bleeding risk of your patient and then prescribe the therapy uh, in non-ST elevation MI ACS exclusively guide the guidelines. And the bleeding risk can be multifaceted. Is a patient characteristic, age, sex, race, history of bleeding events, clinical presentation, uh, stable versus ACS, comorbidities, li uh, renal disease, diabetes, PAD, heart failure, medications. Are we gonna treat with oral anticoagulation for AFib or not? Any drug and drug interactions? And of course, utmost any procedural 
aspects and how secure you are about your access in femoral, invasive versus conservative management, <laughs> etc. So a lot of a lot of thought is applied now in order to figure out what we can do in these patients. And again, very very important the low bleeding risk and various alternatives that come up based on the twilight study. Let's see how that is going to be approached in the American guidelines. We're waiting for them uh, in a month or two. Ultimately, we also have to spend a few slides about another new concept and that is an entirely oral combination and needs to and is, and is uh, aiming to uh, investigate whether there may be some synergy of a low dose oral anticoagulant plus an antiplatelet in the long term after ACS. Dual pathway, block the factor 10A as well as block the platelet. And we have some initial data from, from studies. Uh, first of all, this is the Apixaban study, Apixaban twice daily versus placebo. You can see that the, on the on one hand, there was, uh, they didn't to say the, 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 the mace was just about the same, bleeding was significant. Why was that? In my mind, uh, Apixaban was just too much. When you give Apixaban on top of dual antiplatelet therapy, you're probably going to have to reduce the dose in an ACS population without atrial fibrillation. Let's just be very clear here. With, that, with no AFib, AFib is not a factor here because in AFib, you need a big sub anyhow. Um, um, and in the Atlas, um, the Rivaroxaban at a low dose, 2.5 milligrams twice a day. Remember, the AFib dose is 20 milligrams uh, once daily with dinner. This is 2.5 BID was able to show some good efficacy and not yeah, tremendously out of the out of this world bleeding was 1.8 versus 2.4 the team major bleed and obviously it was also a higher minor bleed in this strategy one can say what do you do about if you combine uh, the river oxygen 2.5 bid only with clopidogrel without the aspirin this was not studied in this trial but perhaps that might be a viable option for later on and the same flavor in meta-analysis that maybe some or some of some some uh, some benefit in ischemia. Still, the bleeding is undefined, particularly as I said, because this oral and the low need to be in low dose the oral anti anticoagulants, and we haven't studied them in um, patients with only with clopidogrel combination without aspirin essentially, and see how that goes. That might be valuable in ACS. So, in, uh, in brief, and this is my last slide, we really need to try to strike a balance between ischemia and bleeding risk when deciding on DAP duration in patients with ACS. Ischemia and bleeding risk is very big in, in, uh, in uh, deciding the, the thrombotic strategies in general, but particularly as we're ready to send the patient out. Why is that? Because when patients is in the hospital, we can manage things better with the IV heparin, the enoxaparin, whatever we need. When you send the patient out, you have to really be very, very knowledgeable of how to figure things out in a way that the patient can apply them, as well as you don't increase tremendously the risk. The improvement in drug resistant technologies and techniques have enabled the containment of the DAP duration strategies in patients who have ACS and PCI, and now we're investigating very successfully the P2Y12 monotherapy, such as Ticagrelor, after a short course of DAPT as a novel strategy. And finally, I just introduced just a few slides about the dual pathway inhibition that is not a, that has some potential in high risk patients for ischemia without high bleeding risk. And ongoing investigation is evolving because the initial trials, I think, were, were some issues with the dosage and somehow either the oral anticoagulant was uh, given in full dose as opposed to a low dose or the antiplatelet was not a single agent but was a dual agent. I think we're gonna see many more investigations in this pathway in the future. I'd like to thank you for your attention and invite any comments. Thank you. Yes, indeed, a, a wonderful lecture we have heard in the recent times.
you have completely covered this interesting topic with the com- total clarity and made us to understand the journey also and the need of it we will open for some discussion dr sambasivam could you please start yeah uh, thanks uh, dr uh, george for a wonderful talk taking us all through the uh, uh, aspects of antithrombotics right from 90s to the current uh, dual pathway inhibition i am sure this antithrombotics uh, subject will invoke quite a lot of uh, debates arguments and questions as to how they can be placed in fact uh, currently the uh, there is an Uh, an idea that uh, even aspirin can be used in for prevention in patients with dvt so there's, there's a lot of the changes happening in the antithrombotics so it's a very exciting topic and uh, wonderfully covered uh, so we will now open uh, the discussion aspects um perhaps uh, uh, thank you very much for your comments perhaps i can uh, there are three questions sent to me here on the chat uh, let me ask briefly those questions in the chat and then we can uh, um, uh, see what's going on so the someone asks why do we even need aspirin when the platelet inhibition over 95% can be achieved by dicagrolone and prasugrolone okay number 1 uh, this inhibition only checks the dicagrolone or prasugrolone receptor doesn't check the global platelet reactivity this the receptor level inhibition can be 95% but the receptor level reactivity the, the global platelet reactivity is not going to be nearly inhibited by a single agent and by the way the 95% inhibition is achieved only by iv cangrelor uh the tacagrelor or prasugrelor are in the uh, in the 80% inhibition and the clopidogrel is in the 60% inhibition again for the single receptor uh, uh total thrombotic occlusion and no flow while not crossing can we give to be three inhibitor i would not give a tb3 inhibitor in a, unless you know it's a it's a occlusive vessel before you cross uh cangrelor could be a very good choice these days uh, but successful crossing is uh is a very important um uh if it's uh, you know you never know you think maybe thrombotic maybe chronic so be a little careful there if you don't cross finish procedure there's no point in giving tb3 inhibitor or any other agent if you don't successfully cross the lesion um can the dapt be limited to those managed medically uh, in all honesty uh, about 20% of all acs trials included patients managed medically without pci there is some modest benefit in these patients modest benefit um and sometimes also we need to research stratify for bleeding these patients as well so i would not indiscriminately give it to everyone with uh, uh, with uh, with a, with a medical uh, uh, management i would again restratify those patients as well uh, am i audible sir yeah. yes uh, uh, where do you place the genomic analysis for clopidogrel resistance in today's practice Yeah the unfortunately this analysis were not as reliable as we thought they were uh, although they make sense uh it makes sense if someone tells me you know what uh, you have a gene that's going to make you um you know not respond to tacagrelor or to whatever to clopidogrel then what I'd say you know that's bad and but in practical reason this assumes that we know that 100% what's going on and we really don't the, as i as i said there is a tremendous redundancy in these pathways so the total platelet reactivity and the p2 y12 receptor reactivity are completely two different things and and for all we know maybe one gene that mainly determines this this uh, receptor there may be also other genes that partially determine this receptor who just don't know about them so uh in my mind the pl- the platelet reactivity monitoring uh is only useful in the highest of highest risk of patients what do i mean by that you have a, a very high risk patient heading for surgery and is on clopidogrel or prasugrel or whatever 
I would test these patients in, in order to see that if the reactivity of the platelets is, uh, is very high, don't go for surgery. Uh, and conversely, if a patient goes out of the hospital, has a STEMI or has a shock, had a tremendously bad, difficult course, I would like to know this patient is properly, maximally res uh, responding to whatever drug I give them. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, none of these two patients, the two extremes, were studied in any of the of the of the of the of the studies of the, either the genetic or the pharmacologic resistance. Those studies were done in uh, pretty much all comers, uh, medium risk patients, even low risk patients. But if a patient is low risk, everything will work okay. Not much to add. Uh, so in my mind, uh, this, uh, this is only useful for the minority of patients in the extremest of risk. Uh, in, uh, in your practice, uh, what is Isor React 5, do you think how has it impacted your daily use of Ticaglot or Presubrin? Uh, not much. What has impacted more is that the Presubrin is now generic in the United States and the cost uh, differential is uh, very big and the uh, uh, insurance approvals are more favoring uh, the pressure group. Uh, so that is more of practical. Um, otherwise, the fact that the study is single center and the fact that in my mind, actually there was a pharmacodynamic study <coughs> about the receptors um, and about the platelet inhibition uh, I, it was in Jack this past month, and I I I, I, uh, I wrote down the editorial for that. Uh, I I didn't see much of a difference between the two. Both of them dropped the platelet inhibition tremendously to a very similar effect, to a rather similar effect, um, less than 150, let's say. So uh, it didn't quite make that much sense. The only thing in my mind that makes more sense and explains this study is that the doctors utilize the five milligram prasugrel dose uh, quite a lot on the outside. Uh, and therefore this might explain the bleeding savings. On the other hand, I was disappointed that the authors were not able to clearly provide a sub subset analysis about the five milligrams because they, you know, it was an investigator initiated the study and the patients were not really followed up very meticulously. Um, so they were just unable to know um, who um, who exactly got the five milligram, let's say, pretty much. Um, but in general, their guideline was very liberal towards uh, encouraging or incorporating the five milligram uh, dose uh, as an outpatient. And I think that might explain. I would like to know more data about this uh, study, though that's why it, it has some value, but not a, uh, a super tremendous value. Uh, Dr. Dangas, I have a question for you. So what made you to select the three month period in twilight? And uh, what is your presumption, if at all, we are going to replace uh, the placebo arm in twilight with the clopidogrel alone? and continuing aspirin clopidogrel versus ticagrel alone. Yeah, well, let, let me explain there. The, first of all, at this, at that, when we designed Twilight, the, the duration was one year. Okay, the recommendation was for one year. And uh, uh, nobody was um, uh, talking at all one month. So a three month was actually very revolutionary at the time, and it took us quite a few months to go through the IRB uh, to accept uh, stopping aspirin. So I would say that at that point, it was the lowest possible duration okay. of DAPT in ACS was a three months. At this point, we have a, 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 a thinking to start Twilight 2 with one month um, uh, uh, DAPT and stopping aspirin after one month. Um, now, regarding substituting agents, I would say that the prasugrel would be a better option 
as a second, although no study done, I would feel a little nervous about the clopidogrel monotherapy in ACS uh, because of the advent of the resistance that we have, the non-responder, let's say. The non-responder status makes me somewhat nervous. And the non-responder status to prasugrel or tagagrel is very low. Uh, clopidogrel would be up to 30%. We're essentially saying that we're going to go ahead and stop an aspirin while our patient population may have a 30% chance, they may not have a great response to clopidogrel. I don't know if this matters because no study was done, but I can tell you, I'm nervous. And I, I would not want to go and say, you know what, I, I, you know, uh, uh, I wanna do that. So when you're talking about DAPT and stopping DAPT, when someone is aspirin and clopidogrel, you're really talking about stopping the aspirin. And if there is a recent stent, let's say, if there's no recent stent, oh, absolutely, you know, then clopidogrel could be a very good option if there's no recent stent. Uh, but if we go into a recent stent area that uh, you want to stop DAPT, maybe stop aspirin when you give a prasugrel or tacagrel, especially because that's a proven one, is definitely definitely an option. Uh, that's how I would summarize my comfort, comfort level. On the other hand, if you have an ACS patient with, who had a chronic um, multivascular disease, let's say carotid uh, or, uh, you know, peripheral vascular, then in those patients, after the three or the six months of that, whatever, uh, then you deal with that, then you can go a clopidogrel monotherapy long-term because they have multiple vascular diseases. And this is a patient in the near future, we're going to think about possibly combining the low-dose uh, uh, rivaroxaban or low-dose apixaban or low-dose whatever else uh, you want to combine with a clopidogrel. Um, the multi-level vascular disease patient is a particular risk. Dr. Dongas, uh, I have a question. Uh, I will, uh, two questions I would say. First is, uh, well, how do you compare uh, global leaders uh, uh, versus uh, Twilight, apart from uh, the global leaders being in all commerce trial and uh, looked at a particular stent? That's number one. And number two, if you look at the guidelines on ESC on patients with the atrial fibrillation who are uh, having a PCI, after one year, the recommendation is uh, just uh, an anticoagulant. Uh, if I'm not wrong. So what was the rationale behind this? Yes, the, uh, 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 the uh, global leaders, uh, I must say it was a study that was done in an innovative platform. Uh, um, uh, and this one was not too much adjudication and the event was death or Q wave MI. So in that respect, many events may have been practically uh, been uh, missed. And uh, there was a, a subsequent study of a fraction of the uh, LOBA leaders that were essentially um, about 20 academic medical centers that on their own, they had employed event adjudication and the more class at the, at the more that a very classic MACE endpoint. And those results are very, very uh, in line with, uh, with the twilight, thereby implying that perhaps the other centers, uh, just by uh, uh, only focusing on death or QFMI, they may have um, gone, some other events may have gone miss, missed just by the regular practice. Um, so that's number one. And number two, in the ACS patient uh, with, um, um, uh, uh, with AFib, uh, we have a plethora of, uh, Actually, they're not ACS, actually, they're, they're, they're PCI plus AFib. We have a plethora of studies, and each one of them indicates that if we combine a oral anticoagulant and just clopidogrel, no aspirin, uh, we have a good outcome. Um, and rivaroxaban uses a little bit of a lower dose, 15 milligrams instead of the 20 for all patients. Uh, the apixaban goes full dose, 5 BID, 
unless you need the adjustment anyhow, uh, plus the clopidogrel. Uh, I would not combine any of them uh, with ticagrelor or prasugrel because I think that w w I want to see clinical trials and bleeding risks here because again, the, the, these very potent antiplatelet agents may pose a significant risk long term uh, after the uh, after the uh, after the they combine with the anticoagulant. Now, after a year, you say, can we leave our patients only on anticoagulant? I think then we have to judge the vascular risk. If the patient is um, um, has multiple levels, has a P PAD, aortic disease, and coronary disease, I would be a little nervous. Uh, and I may want to continue the clopidogrel in combination with the anticoagulant, as we said, uh, for some time. Um, but if the patient is low risk, just a simple stand, you know, maybe majority of patients are may perhaps are like that, then fine, by all means, I think, that, you know, there's no need to add particularly aspirin, I would not aspirin, I would add the, the clopidogrel in the anticoagulant, uh, but uh, I would not do it if the patient is, uh, is stable. And particularly some patients are stable many years after, two or three years after. Uh, then beyond three years, I, I would not give uh, the antiplatelet to anyone. This means that the patient is very, very stable and the full dose anticoagulant, if it's well tolerated, um, then we, uh, it can continue. And let me stress the well tolerated part because uh, over the time, the use of anticoagulant also stratifies the patients a relatively medium to low bleeding risk. Because if someone is able to have already completed anticoagulant for one, two, three years, and you're concerned, what do I do from now on? Patient already selected as being able to tolerate it without bleeding complications. And therefore, uh, it's something also to think about. It's a little different to say at the beginning, oh yes, I will use uh, apixaban for three years, and a little different thing to say, oh, patient has tolerated apixaban for two years, can I give it another year? Um, both ways, patient is getting three years of apixaban, but uh, the practical way, that's why we do it in the office, is we give it for six months, they're doing well, you continue another six months, you see the patient next year, you will give it again. At any point, if there's a problem, you got to stop it. But if it's successful, then keep on with it. Thank you. Angus, I have got one question, one more question for you. Is it okay? Absolutely. So I've got this one. Uh, there are two different uh, subset of patients who, what we are discussing. On the one end, we are having a we are having two studies that studied patients with chronic coronary syndrome, that is Pegasus Timmy and Compass, where we are giving DAPT or dual antithrombotic, that is one antiplatelet with an anticoagulant in a patient who has been diagnosed with chronic coronary syndrome. On the other end, we are taking out one antiplatelet and recent AHA 2020, there is a study from Korea where they took out uh, P2Y2 inhibitor and continued the patient on aspirin alone. They found there was no difference in the ischemia and there was no difference in the bleeding point. Uh, the comparative arm had prosugrel in that particular study. And there is another study like Twilite where they used a mono antiplatelet therapy with prosugrel alone and they found the similar outcome. So I'm a little bit confused here on a patient who has got a chronic coronary syndrome disease. That means he's not likely to have a, uh, he's likely to have a lesser amount of ischemia as compared to an acute MA patient or, or a patient in whom we put a stent recently. And in the, in the stable patient, we are trying to say, let's give little, little more anticoagulant or let's give little more less potent antiplatelet. On the other end, we are trying to say in a patient who had a recent event, who had a stent, and we are trying to take out one antiplatelet. I mean, I'm kind of, uh, on one end, we are telling something, on the other end, we are telling other thing. I'm kind of, honestly, I'm, I was a little confused. I'm a little confused. Yeah. Okay. Let me explain what's the flavor of that and kind of explain. When you're dealing with an acute patient, okay, who's getting, has an ACS and gets a stent. The studies are not focused to tell you what is generally good for the patient. The focus now, now the current studies, the Twilight, Tico, whatever, all this other studies, the focus to tell you What's the mandatory minimum amount of, of, of DAPT? Okay? So, the mandatory. 
that from then on, if it's not mandatory, you can restratify. You have a patient who has many factors, uh, ischemic factors, multi-level disease, I don't know, gazillion stents, uh, aortic disease, uh, you know, perivascular disease. These patients, you can triage them to a more intense therapy. And at that point, after you triage them, you can say, can I do a better job? Maybe by combining the dual, anti the dual uh, pathway of a low dose antithrombotic plus the clopidogrel, let's say, or something like that in the longer term. But this is after you get over the acute phase and the acute trials are focused to show, is it mandated to give the three, the six, the 12 month? So we try, I would say from one end, the, the, uh, the, the, the acute trials are trying to tell you what's the minimum that's mandated. And the other trials are, are focused to tell you what might be good if safety not an issue. So first you have a limit mandate of good safety. Later on, after you ascertain the safety, say, you know what, hold on. There may be still some people who are high risk. Who are these people? If there's no bleeding risk, can we do better? So essentially you're, giving, you're doing less for people who are high bleeding risk, but you also have a potential to do more in patients who have high thrombotic risk. So I think this is a, uh, how you navigate. It's not, it's not you try, if, if confusion comes if people think that both trials are talking about all the patients. I think uh, the new method is you try to re-stratify. Early on, safety. Once you're safe, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can then uh, uh, look for uh, uh, efficacy more as well. Like we play soccer or you play cricket or you play whatever. You have to play the defense, to play the offense. So you have to secure in the defense, then you can score. Oh, got it. That was a wonderful explanation, Dr. Nangas. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you all also. I don't see any, any more questions in the chat as well. I think we, uh, we definitely answered the, everything that's come up in the chat also. Great. Murli, sir, would you like to... Uh... Yeah. Thamba, do you want to add anything more? No, it, it, it was a pleasure to hear uh, Dr. Dongas and the excellent uh, journey sure. we went through about the past, present, and future of the antithrombotics. Uh, uh, it is a wonderful opportunity to share with him. Thank yes, you. It's a wonderful Thank session, sir. Yeah, wonderful session. The only only thing I would like to add is we would like to see you again. Oh, definitely. Some months again. Later, some months later, please come back. We would love to listen to you at least once a year, if not more. It will be a, it's a real, real academy feast. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, I definitely enjoyed everything. All the platforms work very well. The interaction were very well. The questions were great. And uh, all the setup was uh, a very lively discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Dangas. Thank, thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, all the participants. Thank you all. Bye-bye from you. New York. Bye-bye. Thank you, Samba. Thank you. Thanks.